and squishy computation. And uh, I can't claim the very nice title that is uh, uh, that is is doing as far as they can make out. So thank you for that too. But it's a it's a very apt one, and I'll try and give you a flavor of how I got uh, how I got here because certainly this was not uh, anywhere in my plans. So uh, before I begin, I thought I'd give you some advice, at least the younger people here. And uh, the advice is uh, ask Shashi because he, he gave excellent advice uh, yesterday, and I think I'm not going to try to improve upon that. But I'll give you some I'll give you some expert opinion on how not to do things uh, having been there. Okay, so uh, I've been asked sort of to give you a flavor of how I got to do what I've been doing. And I guess uh, one of the first milestones that the, that occurred to me as I was thinking about this was uh, just getting interested in science through these, this amazing series of books, which alas is no more. How many of you are of the vintage who recollect these, uh, these books? Yeah, a few people back there. So I think I've read almost every single one of these. Um, maybe not that one or that one, but all the science related ones I've, I've been through. And this really sort of got me going and thinking about uh, about science as fun. And I think that's the, that's the sense which has stayed with me throughout and sustained me. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm sure that's what it's brought to you here. Um, some, the form this took over various years and uh, growing up was, um, there was this company which just recently folded called Radio Shack. And uh, I feel sorry about that because they had these kits of various kinds. And they had these catalogs of various kinds. And one of the things in the catalog were these mysterious devices called DTL chips. And uh, I, I got, eventually got around to getting some of these things. And I was an enthusiastic uh, hobbyist. And I set fire to more of these than I cared to remember, even though they're extremely robust devices. And this was fun. Um, I actually built a, a computer uh, out of these things, which still hangs in my office. It's a very densely packed piece of pretty circuit board and lots of connections. Um, and that sort of set me somewhat more on the technical computing side of things. So my route took me, naturally given this technical computing angle that I got into, my route took me through IIT, uh, which uh, many of you have, have uh, encountered one way or another. And through school, through, through IIT, I was utterly convinced I was going to do physics. Um, that was what made sense, and what's more, what, I, what experience I had of biology in school was actually pretty miserable. Um, we were asked to memorize things, I was not terribly keen on that. We were asked to draw things, I was really bad at that. And um, it just wasn't fun. It was, it was like the life had been taken out of life sciences. It was awful. And, you know, the, for example, I, I did this project, uh, summer, pro summer project where, for school, where I was supposed to go and observe, uh, do something. So I observed wildlife. I was living on JNU campus, so wildlife was very plenty. And so I used to go out well, 5 o'clock every morning and with my little camera and take pictures of, of the seasons. And this is a good time to do it because it goes from very, very hot and dry to the rainy season and it all sorts of nice transitions. And my biology teacher, what he did was, he took this very painstakingly compiled record of this of these seasonal changes. And as far as I can tell, he just took it, graded it in some haphazard way, and threw it away. I wanted it back. It was, anyway, never mind. So I was seriously turned off biology. Anyway, I survived that, and in uh, through a very similar interest routes, I ended up at Cambridge University as an undergrad. And there I had to do another subject other than, so they have a strike off system. And I had to do something else, so I, I, I said, okay, I'll do biology. I'll, I'll endure it one more, one more year. And during the course of that year, I realized actually biology is interesting. And if I had to point to one moment that actually transformed my view of it, it was when uh, we took up a, a brief a class which happened to have bacteriophage lambda as an example of things. And I looked at bacteriophage lambda and I said, you know, this is a really badly written computer program. The way the logic works, the way things are organized, it, I just, 
I just thought this is wonderful. This is, this is absolutely amazing to watch the logic, the computation going on in here, and it's evolved. At the same time, there is this marvelous uh, teaching tool called the BBC Micro. Again, I wonder how many of you have encountered this. This is an absolutely classic piece. We had one of those. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was great. Because this is where, you know, one can have formal classes in computing, but there's nothing like just playing with it. And for just turning the machine on, you could immediately start programming with this thing. And you could get to do graphics with one or two lines. It was absolutely wonderful. So between these two things, you know, here's the, the the bacteriophage lamp, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with how the logic of this works. And it's absolutely a marvelous mess. And this is how you know an engineer or a programmer would do it. You'd have just a couple of feedback things with uh, interlocking negative feedback. We're going to take all the circuit. But this implements that, and it does so in the context of real world. Anyway, so this is what sort of turned the, the tide for me. And so although I completed a, a degree in physics, I said, you know, I'm going to, I, I think I'm going to do biology. And I had to uh, actually toss a coin at one point between plasma physics and, uh, and biology. And fortunately, I chose biology because I don't know if any of you have been following plasma physics, but they, they put back the date for the plasma physics, uh, big plasma physics experiment, the European Taurus, by another five years. So, <laughs> so now it's. Uh, a lot of 30 plus years and counting since I, since I had to make this decision. Okay, so off I went to Caltech, and there I got the opportunity to do both biology and computers, and that was great fun. I took part not in, uh, in any religious uh, revival, but in a program called Genesis, which was a neural simulator program. And this was a great, this was enormous fun to program. In fact, um, I, I have to say I'm a little bit uh, hooked on this. I like programming, and this is a major distraction. Uh, I like it too much. Um, so anyway, I did that. I, as part of my PhD, I used it to do models of, of, of cells. And this is sort of where the interface between biology and computation started to take shape. At that point, I sort of got an inkling. You know, there's more to computation in biology than just uh, electrical stuff that uh, is such fun to do. And that took me to uh, my postdoc work, which was actually by way of the tour. I actually wanted to work on mosquitoes um, for various complicated reasons that didn't happen. But I, had, I tell you, I had solved mosquitoes. I had figured out that if you do some, if you harness something called meiotic drag, you can exterminate mosquitoes within a few generations. Minor detail that it's already been tried and it doesn't work, but that's okay. <laughs> but, Anyway, so mosquitoes didn't happen, and so therefore we still have to deal with mosquitoes in real life. But I got instead to, oh, I also thought I'd do molecular biology. I thought this was actually wonderful. And so um, I was really bad at it. And I gained a huge appreciation for people who do molecular biology, and I was assured myself I wouldn't do uh, it again. Though, unfortunately, in these days, one has to still work with transgenic mice, so I guess I'm back sort of where I started. Anyway, so what I did work on was molecular computation. And this, I think, is, an, is um, in some ways the most uh, pervasive aspect of life. And I'd like to make the case that beyond thinking of how life works, how cells work, how the body works, in terms of the structural proteins or the energetic requirements or repair or any of these things, I think a very interesting and useful way to think of it is in terms of computation. Of course, as in all things biology, this is messy, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Anyway, so I got to work on, on this uh, computation through, bar, through chemical signaling. And this was my postdoc work with Ravi Iyengar in Mount Sinai. And we made this uh, haystack of a, of a reaction diagram, which actually is very interesting. For example, if you dig deep in that haystack, you'll see this feedback loop. And this feedback loop has a property of memory. It stores information. That is, if you start the feedback loop at some low state of activity, it will withstand various kinds of perturbations and come back to its low state of activity. But if you give it a strong enough kick, such as through calcium signaling, that can push it into a high state of activity. And again, that's a stable state. So you can think of this as a switch, which will stay one way or another way, and take significant effort to cause it to flip. Therefore, it retains information about the parts. 
So why is this interesting? This is interesting because there is decisions happening all the time in all of your cells, and these decisions have to be remembered. I mean, the you know, for developmental biologists, these switches decide, for example, which route down the developmental uh, decisions the uh, cell takes, and then it remembers those decisions. But as someone with an interest in neurobiology, this all related kinds of switches are what build up memory, as we think of them. Of course, it's a very long way from these switches to uh, real memory, but that's that's part of the journey. That is that is what we're interested in. Okay, so at this point, uh, Abid Siddiqui reappeared in my life. In fact, he had uh, his his sister Rana uh, lived across our block in Janu, and we used to go to her whenever we had uh, the usual childhood uh, accidents and scrapes and so on, because she 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 had medical training. So anyway, one fine day, my dad said, okay, you, you should go over there and talk to this uh, uh, Imrana's uh, brother, who happens to be visiting him. Um, and I, he said, biologist, I mean, why do I want to talk to this guy? But anyway, I, since my dad said I wanted to talk to him, and I completely forgot about it. And then many years later, Obey three appears, and he, we sat, I sat with him over coffee um, mm -hmm. at another a coffee shop in New York City, and until they threw us out, because we weren't uh, drinking enough coffee. Um, and he told me all about the plans for this new institute he was setting up on CBS. And so that, through that, through that impetus, and you know, this is totally unplanned. I, I mean, talk about a random walk. I was, I was just doing what, what was the next interesting step, and have, fortunately, a made happened along and steered me to CBS. And so here's a here's a list of, of things that I did, which are sort of go contrary to everything that all the good pieces of advice that, uh, for example, Shashi and others would give you. Because as a, as a fresh young faculty in NCBS, I went through all of these things. I did everything wrong. I tried to save money at the expense of spending enormous amounts of effort building and designing my own circuits with horrible hacks with uh, data acquisition, which I programmed myself and in fact rewired myself. I didn't want to start any project until I worked out all the details, I got them all the parts, I got everything working. And that was the, until that I didn't want to even begin thinking about data. Um, I got amazingly stressed. Um, I can't say that this is past me, but um, I that that, that was, those were those were yeah, it was a tough time. And you know you 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 all are going to go through this. So get stressed, but don't get totally stressed. I tried to do everything myself. And then some things I said, okay, I'm not really going to touch this, I'm going to let someone else do this. And between these two extremes, I can assure you are a good way not to get things done. Um, I had any number of projects which I've started and which are marvelous projects and are sort of dangling and will never get done. Um, so, look at that. And I, of course, again, some, this is something now I, I am an old phobia, I get to tell my younger colleagues. I wanted everything just right before I sent it out to reviewers. I wanted to just sail through the review process and be sure it was going to go in and everything. And of course, that took forever. And of course, the reviewers always say, hey, but you didn't do this. And I felt enormously mortified and upset and insulted. OK, so these are all the things that I did and I did wrong, but the moves on. So this is something that worked. And it worked because, not so much because of me, but because of some actually great students. This is one of the many things that I owe to my many great students. And I guess one of the things which I mentioned towards the end, which I did right, was to give the students a free reign. Say, okay, fine. You don't you totally disagree with me. I dis I disagree with you, but go ahead and try it out. This, this is one of the things I tried out. So this is a, a, a project that Raghav did. And um, what you have here, let me just indicate to you. So at that time I was studying the sense of smell, and asking how is it that rats and other animals, and even humans, figure out where the smell is coming from. And so you have a, a, a source of odor there, a source of odor there, and these two LEDs which the animal can't see indicate where the odor comes from. And this is what the animal can do. Okay, so they've got it wrong. But otherwise, it spits its nose in the odor port. It smells where the odor is coming from. 
and it goes right to where the motor source is. So this is the behavior. The animal is actually impeccable, not totally impeccable, very, very good at figuring out where the odor comes from. And our question is very simple, how does it do it? So we block one of the nostrils. And so just like if you block one of your ears, your ability to localize sound goes down the tubes. Exactly the same happens when you block one of the nostrils of the rat. It turns out that the animal uses stereo. And this is something, this, this question of order guided navigation is something that we pursued for many years since then. And it's been a lot of fun. And this, in some sense, was a, a turning point for, for, for me. Uh, because it, 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 you know, it gave me a lot of confidence when, when, when all of this happens. And uh, I went to some excellent students. Here's some more stuff that I owe to excellent students who went out and did things uh, with my encouragement, but I would have to say that they were the ones in the lead. Um, they built this, this is, a, this is a monstrosity called Heja Fire. Um, I've told this joke to many people. It's, it's a serious joke. Heja means brain and fry means fry. This is a, a two photon microscope and it's backed by a rather powerful laser. And what happens if you apply too much power to your sample? In this case, a slice of brain tissue, is that, uh, well, the smoke comes out of it. Um, so, data got fried, and this is the the microscope of its name. This is, we're now in version 3 of data fry, and it continues to uh, do interesting, very interesting work. But uh, among the many projects that have been uh, initiated on this is one that derives from this, which is, to my mind, one of the most um, Exciting things to see, and let me just uh, see if I can show you this short video. Okay, so what we're seeing, the little bright, little bright balls are cells. They are loaded with a reporter for activity. That is, when the cells are flash bright, that means that the cells are active. And the reason why I love this so much is just the thought that here we are in a position to literally watch the brain as it's doing its computations. And this is now an old movie, and there are hundreds of movies like this, some much more spectacular, but this was taken in my life, and it's just to me totally miraculous to see, to actually watch the brain think. And it reminds me, I don't know how many of you went hark back again to the ancient days when you had big, big mainframe computers, with blinky lights in front of them, and you could watch the, the computers think. There we are watching the brain think. And that to me was such a such a great experience. So that is another of the of the turning points. So at this point, I said, "Oh, I'm going to more or less drop electrical recordings, which I put in a lot of investment into in the lab, and go on to them." And there's of course many other good things to do with optical stuff. So uh, this led to uh, uh, one, of, one of the many projects that was sitting off this was to find that when you remember things, your brain sets up sequences of activity, almost like a bucket brigade of neurons that remember the first stimulus and hold it in, in this sequence until the second stimulus. In this case, uh, I blink a puff of air to the eye that comes along. So the sequence of activity is triggered when the animal learns to associate new stimuli. And this is something that you can watch in this background activity. I won't below the name of the details. But another good aspect of this is that since we are imaging the brain, imaging the cells, you know where they are. And what you find is that the location of cells has actually no correlation with the time or the order in the sequence of activity. Again, maybe not totally shocking, but it's, it's, it's great to be able to actually see these things. So, Here's a, a sort of a, a summary of some of the lessons I've, I've learned, in addition to the ones, the, the things I did totally wrong. But here, maybe this is why things have, to the extent that they have, have worked out. One is to go after doing interesting stuff and stuff that you find is fun to do. This is why you came into science, and I think that if you lose that, you may as well give up and go on. It's great to share things, share your enthusiasm, share your data, share your ideas. I mean, I started out extraordinarily paranoid thinking that, oh my gosh, I better hold on to this idea I have because someone will steal it. But you know what? Everybody has their own ideas. They want to chase their own ideas. They may give you 
insights about your ideas and often very good ideas, good uh, advice. But it's not so likely that they want to see them. I share my software, I share my ideas, and I think I'm the one who's going to lose. I already mentioned this, unleash your students. They are full of brilliant ideas of their own, and they are really the ones doing the nuts and bolts of it, and they can they can lead you off in wonderful and unexpected places. Collaborate with people you like. I won't emphasize that point, but it's such that's, that's <laughs> Uh, Self-explanatory. Be lucky. I don't have a formula for this. I've been extraordinarily fortunate. And you also have to be a little bit bloody-minded. Okay, I'm going to get this damn thing to work. Yeah, up to a point. Okay, so I'll wrap up by indicating where I am now and sort of give you a flavor of how I think of this marvelous sort of underlying theme of population that in my mind pervades all about it. So this creature here is a moose. It's stuffed, otherwise I wouldn't be standing so close to it. Um, that's my uh, colleague and student, uh, Aditya, who's now often moved from the person's lab. And what is moose? Moose is a simulation platform for modeling computations in self living the brain. Um, there's many levels of computation that, that we have to think about, and I wouldn't restrict this, this list just to the brain. Though, of course, the brain is my focus. The point of this is that to understand what the brain is doing, and I would argue also to understand what much of the body is doing, you really need to think of computations across many scales. You need to think about the molecular interactions, the genetic stuff, you need to think about the physical and structural changes, you need to think about reactions and diffusion, but you also need to think about electricity. And these are part of computation, and this is, in some ways, the internet, if you like, of life. It's all of these things uh, brought into each other. So let me tell you a little bit about social computation as I see it. First of all, this is a sort of summary slide, it's evolved and not engineered. I already explained what really dragged me into all of this was that bacteriophage lambda turned out to be such a marvelous hack. But at the same time, these systems are amazingly robust. They survive the real world. And that's a lot more than you can say for any of these computers or, or mobile phones which you drop on the floor and that's the end of it. Real life is extraordinarily robust and it works in the most often circumstances. This is an amazing contradiction because if anybody wrote code the way that evolution writes code, that code would not work. And yet, evolutionally written code works beautifully. Except when it doesn't. Okay, let me just explain this next point a bit. So, let's think of the classical idea of computation. You have some data and you have a program. The data sits in memory, the program runs in the CPU, and somehow all of this comes together to do your computation. Right? In fact, the standard Harvard architecture, which is what all your computing machines use, is that you have data memory, which stores your data, the numbers, the inputs that you give it. You have your program memory, which stores the, the instructions. And then the CPU takes a lot of care not to mix these two up, and it executes the program using the data. Okay, so this is the standard model for computation. Now, supposing you allow the program and data to share space. And in, in principle, they occupy the same, the same chips, but there's a lot of care taken that they don't talk to each other. And the reason is that once you start writing code that modifies itself, in other words, once the code becomes part of the data, it becomes fiendishly difficult to analyze. In fact, so hard that nobody does it. So this is a bad way to write a program. Except this is precisely what DNA does. The program and the data are on the DNA. Okay. All the regulators, all of the interactions and feedback loops and all are on the DNA. And yet the DNA is also coding for all of the, uh, the, the, the instructions to make the proteins that execute these operations. So that's bad. That makes Quite tricky to think about. But it's worse than that. Yeah. There's no separation between the, the data and the program and the physical memory itself. The data is not only having a collision between data and program, it's also the memory, it's also part of the hardware. So that's bad. But it's even worse than that. Because the whole system, the cell as a whole, 
modifies itself. It's as if your program could rewire, the program had a soldering iron which went in and changed the connections on your, on your CPU. So your entire signaling cascade, your cells, are remodeled all the time. This is like you're driving along at high speed on a highway and you are rebuilding the engine as you're going along. It's completely insane and this is what life does. Yeah. So this is, to my mind, one of the marvelous challenges intellectually and conceptually. Think about how, how do you make sense of this? How do you understand this complete hodgepodge of computation, data, program, hardware, everything mixed together and yet working so effectively? Well, that's what, that's what we're here to do. So, for example, uh, you have these, these circuits which I showed you, and this is just one synapse in, out of 10,000 on one cell in your brain which has 10 to 11 of these cells. Yeah. So there's some 10 to 14, 10 to 15 of these synapses, and they are just a complete mess of signaling molecules. Most of these are signaling molecules, there's a two or two there, uh, which are advanced some structural function. But the point is, this is, this ever-changing and dynamic thing is the substrate for the computation and the need for uh, functional life. So, some of the ways one thinks about this um, are due to, for example, beta Alan Turing. And he came up with some mathematical predictions for how you can form patterns in space to organize this. And you can get nice patterns like this. If you look long, at, long, long enough at it, you log it in the facts. So that's one approach. For example, the bistable switches are another kind of high-level concept that we can try to bring to air on this madness. But that's not the only one. And so what we're doing now, and this is sort of the ongoing work in the lab, is to look at specific examples of computation from my favorite system, the brain, um, using uh, memory. How many of you know this name of this thing? It's called yeah, persistence of memory. Yeah, it's a value painting. And the reason is that Memory is actually extraordinarily impersistent. It's very hard to sustain information in such a squishy system as the brain. You have turnover, you have fresh molecules synthesized, and yet the brain manages to store it. So we've been modeling this at very big, at whole range of scales, asking how the electrical signaling, how the chemical signaling. I was going to show a demo here. Yeah. I think I have two minutes to do so. Let me see if this works. So this is a, a real demo in the sense that I'm actually running a simulation before your very eyes, and if it crashes, then not too bad. Okay. So here we have a neuron, which is being modeled. As we see, there is some activity going on in this cell. Just look at the absolutely glorious detail of crunching in this. I don't even have spines on this, but this kind of a neuron will have in the region of 20 to 30,000 spines. Yeah? The waves model, so each of, look at each of these little bumps. They're, they're all small segments of the neuron. Each of them will have one or two spines on it. And each of those will have that enormous computing machinery I showed you a couple of slides ago. Yeah? And so this is the, the kind of system that we would like to, to understand and to model. Okay, so this is a completely insanely ambitious thing to do, but it's something that a lot of neuroscientists are buying into. It's a great time for doing neuroscience, as in for biology as a well, whole, but neuroscience is, it's great. You can, you can control activity in the brain through light. You can read out activity in the brain through light. You can do all sorts of marvelous genetic tricks. So, I mean, you can now reconstruct entire sections of the brain. It's just amazing. So, I hope that we'll be able to get, make some headway into these questions about how uh, all of these squishy things compute. And I think that these will have many lessons for other, other parts of biology as well. Okay, so I'll just leave you with uh, a couple of closing thoughts. I'm sure they're, they're especially for the younger ones. And uh, the first one of them is to fail. That is, you should go out and do things which don't work. Not that you don't want them to work, but you should be trying things which are crazy enough that if they do work, it'd be actually great. And most of the time, they won't work. And I have littered all sorts of great projects which do work, 
for whatever reason, but it's been a lot of fun, and that's how you get to do things which really turn out to be uh, unusual. You try to do something different. So failing is one good thing, uh, although it may seem. Yeah? And uh, let me see if I can recall the other things that I had in mind. So I'm not blanking out on Take good notes. Take good notes. I'm sure. I was actually sure I remember it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. And that's something which this meeting is about. Yeah. And the the thing is giving back. So I I, I can't say I'm the most gracious person for giving back. I I whine, I groan, I moan when I'm asked to do things which take me away from playing with science. But it's by giving back, it's by contributing to your colleagues, by contributing to people who are coming after you, and contributing to your institutions. That's what makes it possible for this endeavor of science to work. It's a, it's a cooperative endeavor, and doing it on your own, you're, you're, you're not going to get that far. It's going to be very lonely out there, so to give back is the other uh, big point I wanted to make. Thanks, uh, Ron, since Ron made this point very effectively. Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, these people and these agencies and these collaborators. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much.